Thank you for inviting me, and I'll try to get through this uh, without coughing to death. I, I need to be in a Jones trial for respiratory infections, I think. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to just spend a little bit of time at the start just talking, uh, musing a bit. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, something that came out of one of the early Jera Science meetings, talking about uh, the seven pillars of aging, and we put this together in a review. And I, I just want to make a few points about this slide, because I think what's important about the slide is not the individual pillars, but the connectivity of the pillars. Um, that really, when I think of aging, I think about healthy aging as maintaining a homeostatic network. Uh, that really keeps you in equilibrium, keeps you functioning in spite of the fact that there are things damaged that's happening to you as you get older. Um, and uh, it's pretty amazing when you look at the, the literature how connected these things are. Uh, so if you think about what drives or what causes aging, I think we all used to think there was a cause of aging or a few causes of aging. But the way I think about it now is that there are multiple entry points into damaging this network and maybe these pillars and probably others that you can do that and when enough of these pillars get damaged this crosstalk is what gets affected and when the crosstalk breaks down that's when you start getting chronic diseases um, and so uh, to me the interventions that extend lifespan are ones that really maintain the network and we have lots of papers showing how rapamycin or any of your favorite interventions affect each of these pillars individually but to me it's not clear what's primary and what's secondary because I think of it more as maintaining that equilibrium. And so I'm going to make some wild predictions about the field of aging. And I think this is a good place to do this because most of you, by the time they're proven wrong, will have forgotten that I made the predictions anyway. So um, first of all, I think it's going to be easier to slow aging than it is to treat chronic diseases. Because if you go back to this concept in the last slide about maintaining equilibrium, I think that's just fundamentally going to be easier to do uh, to prevent disease than it will be to wait till you have some chronic disease and, and, and essentially you're trying to reverse entropy at that point to get you back to health. Most of our treatments for chronic diseases don't bring you back to health. They keep you alive longer and help you in many ways, but they don't completely solve the problem. So I think maintenance is going to be a lot easier than reversal. Um, I think many, uh, I actually think that more of the uh, uh, data from aging in animal models will be conserved in humans than you find from diseases. And I think that this idea of artificially creating diseases in mice and then finding interventions to treat those diseases is certainly had its value. I'm not saying it's, it's not a valuable approach, but I think it's also has a number of concerns. And one of them is that we typically make diseases in young mice that happen in old people. And so using age appropriate mice for disease models is one thing I would recommend. But the, but the difference with aging is that we're studying the natural processes that happen during a mouse's lifespan comparing that to what happens in humans. And, and I think that that's, even though many of those processes are individually different, the general concepts are gonna be the same. So it's my hope that a lot of the interventions we find will in fact be conserved. Um, also, I think that you know, the, the idea that in most of these cases, we're not doing anything super physiologic to the animal to make it live longer. When I think of the interventions that are happening, most of them to me are preserving the dynami dynamicity of the individual pathways with aging. And inflammation was brought up earlier, so I'll use that as an example. We need inflammation, as was pointed out by Janet. So the, the, the important thing for health is maintaining inflammation at low levels when you don't need it, and then uh, having it turned on when you do need it. And the problem with aging is that chronic inflammation is creeping up so that we have a constitutive inflammatory signal. Uh, and then that also means it's hard to induce when you need it. So the interventions in rapamycin has this property tend to maintain that dynamicity. They keep inflammation low uh, when you don't need it, but you can still get a, a signal when you need it. And I think it, that's gonna be the strategy, at least for the gero protectors for, for healthy aging. I think we used to lament that it was impossible to find aging biomarkers, and now I think that they're relatively easy to find using these new strategies. And I'll echo Vadim's point that I think these are really a critical discovery in the last few years, uh, and they will allow us to at least conceptually test the interventions. 
I think they're pretty much anywhere you can find a deep data set with enough people and some AI, you can identify markers of aging. What we don't know right now for all these different biomarkers that have emerged is how they relate to each other, uh, which ones respond to interventions and over what time frame. And I think that's a critical step in terms of research going forward to answer those questions. And then finally, I think ultimately we're going to have to think about personalized aging. Uh, and different people are going to have uh, enter that network breakdown through different pillars. Uh, that's going to depend on environment, genetics, lifestyle. And we're going to have to begin to understand how aging is different in each individual as well as how it's the same in each individual. And we're trying to do studies to begin to address that question. I won't talk about today, but I can talk to you afterwards if you're interested. Okay, so here's my slide on lifespan interventions. Uh, I just want to make a couple points. Uh, first of all, there, there's a whole range of behavioral interventions that seem to work. I, I put question marks around alcohol. Uh, we have um, numerous mice on 10% ethanol in the drinking water in my lab in California. And uh, actually, they're doing quite well as they age, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, and then there are a number of small molecules uh, that you've heard some about already. Uh, and we've worked a lot on rapamycin uh, in, in my lab, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, we're kind of interested in trying to find a, a new interventions, and I'm going to tell you about one of those. But before I go on to that, I just want to make the point, since this is a metabesity meeting, that almost all of these interventions are affecting metabolism in one way or another. Uh, metformin and acarbose are actively diabetes drugs, um, and rapamycin, NSAIDs, stacks, NAD precursors, factors in young blood and synolytics all either directly affect metabolism or they affect inflammation, which is a big risk factor for metabolic disease. So, um, and that can be argued for at least three of these behavioral interventions. And, and we find in the mice that alcohol protects against a high fat diet as well. So I think there's a, a lot of conservation between how we think about metabolism and metabolic disease and how we think about aging. And so um, that also raises the point that there are a whole range of other drugs that are used to modify metabolism, and we should be thinking about those in an aging context as well. Um, so I'm going to spend uh, some of the rest of my time just talking about another intervention that we've discovered recently that impacts aging, and this uh, actually came from sponsorship from a company, PDL Health, so I have to disclose that. Uh, and what they were interested in is finding combinations of natural products uh, that have impacts on aging. And the reason I like natural products is that the route to um, uh, interventions in humans is a much easier route with natural products, depending on a range of factors. But they tend to be more safe, although there's no guarantee of safety. And so we thought if you can find compounds like NR and NMN, you can probably find other compounds that affect aging as well. So the idea was to use worms and find combinations that have additive effects on aging. Um, for instance, this guy in red here is long-lived compared to the control. Intervention 2 in blue is long-lived, and when you put them together in orange, you get an additive effect on aging. And then to test those in mice. And in mice, we didn't just use lifespan. We used this frailty index by Susan Hallett, uh, which we really like. It's a relatively non-invasive metric of uh, 31 different points that together give you a composite score of frailty that arguably has a relationship to human frailty. Um, and so I'm just going to tell you about one of the compounds that's emerged from this. It's on uh, BioArchive now if you want to look up the data. And that's alpha-ketoglutarate. So it was originally published about five years ago to have a really pretty strong effect on lifespan in C. elegans. And uh, Gordon Lithgow, uh, the collaborator on this project, was able to show that in worms we can repeat this data. So it, uh, it seems to be uh, pretty, pretty uh, robust. Uh, and so we did a study in mice. And we started the intervention at 18 months of age. We do that with pretty much all of our interventions now because that's a middle-aged mouse where we think about we might do interventions in humans. And rapamycin has a very robust effect at that age. So at least in principle, it's possible to still affect aging at that age. Um, and the effects on lifespan are not that strong with uh, the uh, AKG. They are significant in females. This is a relatively small cohort, but we've repeated it two more times now. 
Uh, it's about a 5 to 10 percent effect in females. It's less in males. Uh, if you put multiple survival curves together, you can get significance. But the, the, I'm not showing you this because of the effects on lifespan. The reason I'm showing you this is we found a dramatic effect on frailty. And that's shown in this slide. So here's this composite frailty metric. And this is uh, each data point is a mouse at a given month of age. Uh, we did this, uh, this measurement longitudinally every two to three months. Um, and you can see that the frailty goes up more quickly in the control animals in blue than it does in the uh, treated animals in red. But this is a difficult way to show this data because what's happening is some of these animals are dying during this time period. And so like this animal, which had a very high frailty at 23 months, was dead by 25 months. And so what we've done is go back and re uh, uh, group the data based on the percentage of the lifespan that the animal was at when we did the frailty matrix. After the animals all died, we could calculate that. So this is 50 to 60%, 60 to 70%, 70 to 80%, et cetera. And you can see in the control animals, the frailty goes up pretty consistently, uh, but it remains very low and only goes up at the end in the AKG-treated mice. So arguably in these females, there's a, only a 5 to 10% extension of lifespan, but almost a 50% reduction in frailty, suggesting that we're compressing morbidity. Uh, we see the same effect in males for frailty. Um, there's 31 different components of this index, and several of them are affected significantly individually as well. Uh, coat condition is one of the biggest ones, and you can see this is the control animals at 27 to 28 months and the AKG treated animals, which look still quite healthy by coat condition. And that all leads to the question of what is AKG doing to affect aging? And this is where we're spending a lot of time and effort and coming up with more hypotheses than we have answers at this point. Um, alpha ketoglutarate is really a central component of the Krebs cycle, or the TCA cycle, um, and it does a ton of different things in the cell. One of the important things to say, though, is that the AKG levels go down with aging. That's been shown in humans. Uh, it's it's uh, been shown in, at least unpublished in mice. And it, we also have data in worms that it goes down with age. So it's a little bit like NAD levels. The levels decline with age. And restoring them seems to be beneficial. And one of the reasons it might be beneficial is it's providing crosstalk between amino acid catabolism and carbohydrate metabolism. So you can think of this as a metabolic flexibility molecule that allows you to convert between different pathways that are important for uh, energy sources for the cell. Uh, but AKG also does a number of other things, and one of the ones that intrigues us a lot is that it activates these TETs that you heard about earlier from David that control, uh, we think, the epigenetic clock, and we're very interested in studying that. It also activates HIF-1, which is in the hypoxia response, and so we're trying to sort through these different potential mechanisms by which AKG might affect aging. One other piece of data before I go on is that AKG is very anti-inflammatory, so this is a 10-month treatment in mice. Um, you're looking at levels of individual inflammatory cytokines, which go up pretty dramatically over that window in a control animal, and it's largely suppressed in the AKG-treated animal, and here's some individual components below. So um, we're trying to figure out whether this is through a senolytic or mechanism or some other mechanism, but it seems to be very anti-inflammatory, which is also true of rapamycin. So just quickly to end, uh, we're trying to set up this Center for Healthy Aging in Singapore, and the thing I like about being at NUS is that it has very good preclinical research, but we have a hospital right next door, so we can do clinical studies, and the National University Health System really controls the health care for about a third of the Singapore population. So uh, we have an, a p potential to take interventions preclinically, test them in the clinic, and then scale them into the population in a relatively fast manner. Uh, so we're looking at uh, sort of short to midterm interventions to start with, about six-month treatments using biomarkers, not because we're seeking regulatory approvals with these studies, but more because we want to test multiple different kinds of interventions and stratify which ones are having the biggest impact on aging. So we're looking primarily at a healthy population, but we're also trying to find specific niches where aging may have a really big impact. So in this case, predicting, using biomarkers to predict surgical outcomes, uh, looking at female reproductive health and fertility, and also we're trying to work with 
Uh, every government program in Singapore now has an exercise component to it, encouraging people to get on exercise, and we want to use biomarkers to measure what levels of exercise are actually having the biggest impact. Uh, and so with that, I'll stop, and I'm happy to uh, take questions in the discussion. Thank you.